Hey everybody, welcome back. This is another session of English 1102 and another piece from the Ethics and Morality module. In this session, we're gonna go through four poems. They are Ethics by Linda Paston down here at the bottom, and then Adding It Up by Philip Booth, What the Living Do by Marie Howe, which is the last one down on the list here, and some advice to those who will serve time in prison by Nazim Hikmet. Give you, I'll give you a little bit of information about each of the poets, and then we'll jump, then we'll jump into the poems and work through them, cover any important information that you need to know that you might need to use for the exam, important concepts, things like that. We're gonna start with Ethics by Linda Paston. Let's make this a little bit bigger for you guys. I think that's as big as it'll let us make it. This is a simple little poem. Um, we're going in this order, ethics, adding it up, what the living do, and some advice to those who will serve time in prison, because it sort of works from the abstract and the education to the practical and the way that you act out ethics and morality. This one starts off with some students in a classroom, totally abstract, no practical experience. In ethics class, so many years ago, our teacher asked this question every fall. If there were a fire in a museum, which would you save? A Rembrandt painting of an old, a Rembrandt painting or an old woman who hadn't many years left anyhow. So the teacher asked the students this ethical question, what do you save? This valuable piece of art or this elderly person who doesn't have a lot of years left? The, the piece of art is this sort of timeless value. It's priceless in, in some sense. The elderly woman has lived a, f a full life and who may not have much left, m many years left. And she asked this room full of young people and they just, they can't imagine either of those situations really. The being elder, you know, when you're young, being old and elderly is almost impossible for you to imagine. You're like, that'll never be me. Um, you just can't understand what that is and you also can't it's also hard to imagine something that has existed for hundreds of years and is priceless and beyond time restless on hard chairs caring little for pictures or old age again these students just can't relate really to either of these things we'd opt one year for life the next for art and always half-heartedly y'all know this you've had this experience the teacher asks you some question you just can't you just don't really care like Whatever the answer is, you're just like, yeah, sure, whatever. Sometimes the woman borrowed my grandmother's face. The narrator, the speaker in this poem is trying to personalize this a little bit, trying to connect with it on a more personal level. The woman borrowed my grandmother's face, leaving her usual kitchen to wander some drafty half-imagined museum. One year, feeling clever, I replied, why not let the woman decide herself? And so she, she tries to switch up the problem. The speaker in the poem is going to switch up the problem. Linda, the teacher would report, eschews the burdens of responsibility. So the teacher's response to this is, oh, so you're just trying to take the responsibility of the decision off yourself and put it on somebody else. This fall, and then there's this jump in this poem that where what happens is the poem jumps from this abstract imagine this, you know, some teacher in a classroom asking you something that is very different than the personal lived experience and you being in it. This fall, in a real museum, I stand before a real Rembrandt, old woman, or nearly so myself. And so now, she is an older person, she's not a child in a classroom anymore, she's in a museum, and she's looking at a real Rembrandt painting. So she is living out the, um, the concept that she was asked about. It's almost like she's gone from science class to science lab, where she's actually having a real lived physical experience. And as you guys all know, that sort of abstract thinking is very different than being put in a situation yourself and having to make a real decision. The colors within this frame are darker than autumn, darker even than winter, the browns of earth. Though earth's most radiant elements burn through the canvas. I know now that woman and painting and season are, all, are almost one and all beyond saving by children. And so the conclusion she comes to at the end of this poem is, the reason that they couldn't decide, the reason that they couldn't engage with or effectively answer this question is 
the way that you make moral and ethical decisions is through this practical lived experience. It's not, you know, no matter how many exercises or thought processes you go through about what you might do or how you might act or what you might want, the living it out and the practical experience is where real morals and ethics c come from or at least come into play. You have to be in the situation yourself to really fully understand it. Ethics is not some imaginary exercise. It has to do with practical reactions and pra to, to everyday situations, to real life. That is also what adding it up sort of deals with is you get this one perspective for how this person prepares for the day. Um, this is very much a poem uh, about the moment right after you wake up and that lying in bed, not ready to get up yet, and the thoughts that go through your mind and thinking about what happened yesterday, but especially how what you've got to do today and how you're going to do it and how you're going to manage and organize your day. My mind's eye opens before the light gets up, so the person wakes up before dawn. I lie awake in the small dark, the last, the, last little, uh, the last little darkness before the sun comes up, figuring payments or how to scrape paint. Guy laying there thinking about what he needs to do that day. I count rich women I didn't marry. I measure bicycle miles I pedaled last Thursday to take off weight. So he's thinking about things he's, he did in the past, um, you know, regrets that he, that he might have about things he didn't do, things he did do. I give some passing thought to the point that if I hadn't turned poet, poet, I might well be some other sort of accountant. That's an important idea in this poem, this, this accountant, because he doesn't necessarily mean like a uh, tax accountant or a financial accountant. He means the way that he organizes his life and the way that he gets up and thinks every morning is in this sort of accounting, accounting for things he did, accounting for things he didn't do, accounting for things he needs to do. Before the sun reports its own weather, my mind is openly at it. I chart my annual rainfall, or how I'll plant a seed if I live to be 50. I look up words like bilateral symmetry in my mind's dictionary. I consider the bivalve mollusk, repick last summer's mussels on Condon Point. So again, what you get right here is all of this, things that he has thought about or worried about or considered. I listen hard to how my heart valves are doing. So he, he checks in on his own physical health. He's like, how healthy do I feel today? Am I doing all right? I try not to get going too early, bladder permitting. It's pretty obvious. Often when you wake up in the morning, you need to go to the bathroom. He's like, I try to lay in bed as long as I can, as long as my bladder will let me. I mean to stay in bed until six. I think in spirals, building horizon pyramids, yielding to no man's flag but my own. I think of Saul Steinberg. I play touch football on one leg. I seesaw on the old cliff. So he goes through all these memories in his mind. Job, wife, children, myself. He's trying to balance out all of his concerns and who needs attention today. My mind's eye opens before my body is ready for its first duty, cleaning up after an old maid basset in heat. So he's thinking about the first practical thing he's got to do when he actually does get up out of bed, which is clean up after their dog. That too I inventory. The Puritan strain will out, even at 6 a.m. The Puritan strain in this poem is that the devil, the idea that the devil's, the idle hands are the devil's playground, that what you need to do is get up and the way, the way that you stay good is to get up and stay busy. That keeps you from having too much time to think and get into too much trouble. Sun or no sun, I'm Puritan to the bone, down to the marrow and then some. So he's like, this is, you know, this is who I am. This I always got to be thinking about what I need to do. I always got to be finding something to do, staying busy. If I'm not sorry, I worry. If I can't worry, I count. So he's, if, if I'm not worried about, if I'm not sorry about something I did or didn't do yesterday, I worry about what I need to do today. And if I can't worry, I count. I make a list of all the things I need, I didn't do and need to do. So that's his sort of accounting, his personal accounting is this, regretting what he did or didn't do and worrying about what he didn't do or needs to do or counting up the things he didn't get to yesterday that he needs to do today. So it's all this kind of listing. That's where you get the title, this adding it up, adding up things you didn't get to yesterday, things you need to get to today. That's a particular ethics and morality because the, the way that you be good and stay good and stay out of trouble is keep yourself busy by adding up all these things.
the next poem is in some ways a little bit simpler, but in some ways also a little bit deeper, a little bit more complicated. You see Marie Howe in this picture. She is uh, a New York poet. She is still alive. Um, she's originally from upstate New York, but is taught in New York City at Columbia, some places like that. Let's see if we can get this a little. There we go. There is one thing that's important to understand about this poem. It is that uh, the Johnny, the Johnny, which is the first word in this poem, she is talking to her brother who passed away. And this poem is about what living is about, especially in the light of part of what you have to do is live for the people who aren't around anymore, the people who are close to you, the people who you remember. Your living is the thing they can't do anymore. All right, Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there. The draino won't work, but smells dangerous. And the crusty dishes have piled up, waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the everyday we spoke of. That's what, part of what this poem is about is the everyday. The, every, the little everyday tasks that when you're alive often feel overwhelming and annoying. And you're like, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that next week. The... You know, you need to call some repairman or wash the dishes. All, all this everyday stuff that when that feels annoying, but is really part of what the living do. That's part of life. Life is made up of these little moments, these little tasks. It's winter again. The sky is a deep, headstrong blue, and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here, and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking. Again, the kinds of little problems that you have in everyday life. <coughs> the kinds of everyday problems that when, you're li that when they happen, they're super annoying. The, oh, I've got to drive over here, or this bag of groceries broke. These little minor inconveniences. But she says, for weeks now, I've been thinking, this is what the living do. This is most of life, is doing, taking care of these little tasks and dealing with these little problems. And, and that is beautiful. That is valuable and important in and of itself. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks and the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, another little, little problem, I thought it again. And again later when buying a hairbrush, another little task that sometimes you have to take care of. This is it. Parking. Slamming the car door shut in the cold. What you called that yearning. What you finally gave up. When you're, when you're dead, you don't have these little worries or concerns anymore, but you, but you don't have the little beauty. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call, a letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. That's what life is about, is that wanting and acting and doing what you need to do to get what you want. But there are moments, walking, when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep from my own blowing hair, chapped face, and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. That's the central idea. I'm gripped by a cherishing. That part of what makes life valuable are those moments when you stop and appreciate what you have and, the, and not what you have in some big, massive, overwhelming way, but that you get to go for a walk, that you get to you know, catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror uh, or in some reflection in a car or a store window or something like that, Bl blowing hair, chapped face, unbuttoned coat. Those little moments where you realize, where you appreciate life and, va and value be just simply being alive and being able to have more experiences and do little things, go buy a hairbrush or whatever you need to do, the little running errands that you stop and value them and value every day. Um, I am living, I remember you. She remembers this person, her brother, who is not around to have any more of these experiences, which helps her value every day and value these little moments. And then the last poem on the syllabus is this poem about a person whose ability to enjoy life and to act out their ethics and morals is restricted. Um, this is a poem by Nazim Hikmet. You see, um, he died in 1963, so he's been dead for half a century now. He's a Turkish writer. Um, this poem is based on his personal experience. He spent five years in prison for being a communist. Um, and so 
you know, he was locked up simply for his political beliefs. It's almost like if someone, one of us in the United States was locked up for being a Democrat or being a Republican or something like that. Um, and that, this poem starts off with that idea that if you are sentenced to prison, what you have to do is sort of put your foot down and be like, this isn't going to break me. I'm going to keep going. He says if instead of being hanged by the neck, you're thrown inside so you don't get executed, you get locked up. For not giving up hope in the world, your country, and people. If you do 10 or 15 years apart from the time you have left, you know, you spend 10 or 15 years in prison, that's a long percentage, a long portion of your life. But you won't say, better I had swung from the end of a rope like a flag. You'll put your foot down and live. You won't feel sorry for yourself. You won't be sad. You'll put your foot down and say, I'm going to make the best out of every day. It may not be a pleasure exactly, but it's your solemn duty to live one more day to spite the enemy. The people that are trying to break you, the people that are trying to hurt you, you say, no, not today. Part of you may live alone inside, like a stone at the bottom of a well. But the other part must be so caught up in the flurry of the world that you shiver there inside when outside at 40 days distance a leaf moves. And so again, you're getting some of this similar sentiment of the Marie Howe, What the Living Do poem, which is, the way to stay alive in a place like prison where, you, where your ability to enjoy things is restricted is to enjoy little things. To wait for letters inside, to sing sad songs, or to lie awake all night staring at the ceiling is sweet but dangerous. It's dangerous to do things like that in prison because the letter may never come. You may just make yourself sadder and sadder by singing sad songs. Look at your face from shave to shave. So like take care of yourself, pay attention to the little changes, forget your age. Watch out for lice. Again, take care of yourself. And for spring nights, and always remember to eat every last piece of bread. Every little enjoyment, enjoyable thing, take it all. Take every last little bite. Don't forget to laugh heartily. And who knows, the woman you love may stop loving you. There's some things that are going on in the outside world, you can't control them. Don't say it's no big thing. It's like the snapping of a green branch to the man inside. To think of roses and gardens inside is bad. Why is that bad? Because they'll be gone when you get out. You, you have no control over roses and gardens. They'll bloom and die. To think of seas and mountains is good because they're still going to be there. If you're in prison and you're thinking, when I get out, what I'm going to go do is, is go jump in the Atlantic Ocean and go swimming. Well, it's still going to be there. That's something you can look forward to. Read and write without rest. I also advise weaving and making mirrors. We're back to the Philip Booth idea of the way to pass time is to keep yourself busy. Do everything you can. Read, write, weave, make mirrors. Every little activity you can do to keep yourself busy and make the time pass. It's not that you can't pass 10 or 15 years inside and more. You can, as long as the jewel on the left side of your chest doesn't lose its luster. Gets a little sentimental here at the end, but you get this basic concept that what you have to, the way to keep your heart bright and not get depressed and give up is to do these little things that keep you engaged and active and happy, to take all the little pleasures, all the little bites of bread, and all the little activities that you can still do, to taking care of yourself, like shaving and stuff like that. The way to keep your heart you know, from getting dull and dark is to keep yourself engaged and looking forward to something. Those are, so those are four of the poems from the Ethics and Morality module in D2L. Um, all of them have a little bit of a little different perspective from Ethics by Linda Paston where it makes this argument that the Ethics is this practical experience that you have to act out to some advice to those who will serve time in prison which talks about how to act those kinds of things out when your ability to, to do so is restricted because you're in prison. If you have questions about any of those or, or concerns about any of those, um, be in touch with me via email or however is most convenient to you. Uh, thank you all for your time, and I'll see you next time.